Hi, everyone. Welcome to True Disabled Story. My name is Nico, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm a white man with parted blonde hair, large blue and brown spectacles, and a white, bluish green, kind of checkered button up dress shirt. I'm seated in front of a purple wall and some bookcases. This is my home office. Like roughly 25% of Americans and a full 17% of Philadelphians, I'm disabled. Whether we look locally, nationally, or even globally, disabled communities are full of dynamic, diverse, and frankly delightful people with their own stories to tell. All we have to do is listen. As many of you know, I was born disabled. I've never known differently, and I probably will always be disabled. So I'm, I'm naturally curious, right? When I meet disabled friends and colleagues, uh, I'm naturally curious about their diagnostic stories, kind of what their uh, past diagnosis have looked like. And I can't wait to hear from all of those folks. After all, disability is not a monolith. Today, I'm very lucky to hear from my old friend, Mary Fashik. Um, it's been a joy to see Mary again. Mary's had an incredibly busy year, uh, and I can't wait to hear more about what brought her to uh, this recording. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? Hi, Nico. I'm so happy to be here with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Fashik. I use she, her pronouns. I am a Lebanese-born woman of Saudi, Egyptian, and Palestinian descent. I have dark curly hair and I'm wearing glasses, black headphones, speaking into a black microphone, wearing a yellow flower top, and my background is blurry, but I am seated in my home office in Brunswick, Georgia. Mary, thank you so much. Tell me, what was your path to, to diagnosis like? Was this a surprise or was it something maybe uh, you were actively pursuing with your medical team? Paint the picture for us. So when I was born in Lebanon in 1977, I was adopted at the age of 10 months old. When I was brought into the United States, no one knew I had cerebral palsy. But I wasn't hitting any of those childhood milestones. And my adopted mother took me from doctor to doctor, and no one knew what was going on with me. And one evening, she was watching TV and saw the United Cerebral Palsy Telethon. And she said, that is what my daughter has. And she took me to United Cerebral Palsy in Miami. And at the age of two is when I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. So from the age of 10 months old to the age of two, I had no diagnosis. Um, and it was only until we went to United Cerebral Palsy in Miami that I was diagnosed. And that pattern will repeat where I are in my life. Um, in my 30s, I began to feel extreme fatigue and pain. And I was telling my primary doctor, something is wrong, I don't feel well. And my doctor would tell me, you're getting older. I was barely in my 30s. And he told me, you're getting older. It's just your cerebral palsy. You're just depressed. And years later, I finally was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And that led to being diagnosed with a risk of chronic illnesses. And the one thing that always sticks out in my mind is one of my information markers was seven times higher than normal rate. Now, if that doctor had listened to me and done one simple blood test, we would have known a lot sooner that I had a risk of chronic illnesses. 
Mary, I'm so sorry. It sounds like, you know, simply by luck, your adoptive mother saw this cerebral palsy commercial. And then that, that similarly stroke of luck wasn't there for you in your fibro diagnosis or your chronic illness journey so far. I'm sorry that you didn't get the care you received. That was care you deserved. Thank uh, you. Of it's course. something I advocate for now as someone who wasn't diagnosed till almost four years old. Yeah. It brings me to kind of my second question. What impact have your diagnoses had on your life? And I guess uh, you might also consider what impact has it been like, has it had on your life to to be undiagnosed when all the signs were there? It's been very difficult because it's been a lot of gaslighting by doctors, by medical professionals, and just not being believed when you say, I have extreme fatigue, I'm in a lot of pain, and I think the diagnosis of my disability of cerebral palsy kept my diagnosis for my chronic illnesses at bay, if you will, because for some reason, medical professionals and also society believes that you can't have an outward physical disability and be chronically ill at the same time. You either have cerebral palsy or you have fibromyalgia, you can't have both, but there has to be a link. And that's something I, I do believe. And I remember going to this doctor, and this is such a vivid memory for me. I spoke to the intern who listened very intently to what I was saying. And I remember her going and stepping outside the room and talking to the doctor and hearing the doctor say, there's nothing we can do for her. And basically telling me it was all in my head. And I remember coming home that evening and crying. I was talking to my best friend and crying. And I told her, what if something is really wrong and nobody knows and nobody cares? And I was right. Something was very wrong. Thank you, Mary. It can be very difficult to like advocate for yourself, especially as uh, you're being hit with significant pushback from uh, medical professionals. And I'm really glad that you, you you persevered. One thing that you mentioned in an earlier part of our conversation is that because of the care gaps that you yourself faced, right, you're that much more adamant about um, telling people uh, to make, helping people make sure that they can advocate for themselves, that they don't experience those care gaps. So looking back over these experiences you've had throughout your life, what advice would you give people following um, a similar diagnostic path to you? Or even if you could somehow magically time travel, right, uh, back into your younger life, what advice would you give a younger version of yourself? I think I would tell myself that it's not in your head. I would tell other people the same thing. It's not in your head. You live in your body. No one else lives in your body. You know what you feel and what you experience day to day. And just because someone sat in a medical course for one semester and they had one chapter on chronic illness, does not make them an expert in chronic illnesses. Again, you would be a body every single day. And, you know, it's like, you, again, you know what you feel, you know how you feel. And just, it's hard to advocate, but to continue to advocate, to continue, because now when I go into a doctor, I am that patient that says, I need this. 
I need this. It's not will you give me this. It's I need this. And of course I will see pushback for saying that. But then doctors realize that hopefully that they can't gaslight you because you know. I'll give an example. When I went to my first rheumatologist, I asked the nurse, can I have any other chronic illnesses other than fibromyalgia? And she looked me dead in the eye and said, absolutely not. Well, apparently, she skipped the day that they talked about comorbidities um, because I have a list of chronic illnesses and usually fibromyalgia just come with a comorbidity. So for her to just dismiss me and look at me and say, you cannot have that, you have to be, you have to kind of arm yourself with knowledge going into these situations. And, you know, of course, it doesn't always work out, but at least you know that you've done your research and you know what's going on with yourself. Mary, thank you so much. That's excellent advice and one that I hear from a lot of uh, guests I have on this video series and a lot of just chronic illness folks in my life as well. Indeed, chronic illnesses, much like Pokemon, you can't just catch one. It's, it's kind of a group situation most of the time. Mary, this is an unplanned question, but I want to give you a little more space to talk about uh, those comorbidities that you that you mentioned. So I've been speaking with a lot of folks uh, with different kinds of cerebral palsy on, on this video series. Uh, and then I'm speaking with you now, and we're talking about your cerebral palsy as well as your other chronic illnesses. Um, you mentioned that your early diagnosis of cerebral palsy, you feel helped your other chronic illnesses hide somewhat. So if I'm someone with cerebral palsy and I'm thinking that somebody, that something else is, is wrong, is there like any specific chronic illnesses I should look out for? Any specific symptoms I should be mighty suspicious of? Uh, I just want to give you a space to flex your expertise here. So these are something I've been saying for a while now. I believe that there is a link between cerebral palsy and chronic fatigue syndrome. I truly wholeheartedly believe that there is a link between the two. There is a link between cerebral palsy and chronic illness. And this is something that the medical community, the scientific community, is ignoring. Because after the age of 18, there is little to no research on adults with cerebral palsy. And if there is research, it is done in adults the age of 20, 21. That does not help me at almost 47 years old. I believe that research should be being done in adults that are late 30s, early 40s, late 40s, so we know what to expect. And I, again, I truly, truly believe, and the irony is I also have hypermobile Alexander syndrome. And people say, well, you can't have spastic cerebral palsy and be hypermobile. But I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. It seems like, you know, like a juxtaposition to have both. But I have both. And one does affect the other. And as I watch younger, as I watch children, I see them on their parents putting videos on Instagram and talking about like stress factors and things like that, which I have experienced so much. And it's because of the Elegamo syndrome. And I just want to like scream into the void like your child may have hypermobile Elegamo syndrome, but doctors feel as though you can't be spastic and be hypermobile. But I will tell you an interesting story. When I was two and a half, I was going to have orthopedic surgery. 
And when they put me under anesthesia, when I was asleep, they couldn't do the surgery because my muscles were too relaxed. My body was too loose, if you will. And that is definitely because of hypermobile EDX. And it wasn't until I was a little older that they were able to do the surgery. And I'm still that way. At night when I sleep, I sleep in all weird positions because my body's very loose because of the hypermobility. It's only when I am awake that my body has that spasticity and even so my joints to work it. So I think that is the one thing I want to talk about is that you can have cerebral palsy and have hypermobile hyper-mobile syndrome. And there is absolutely a link between cerebral palsy and chronic fatigue syndrome. And I wish that there would be more research about that. Thank you, Mary. I really appreciate uh, the guidance that you're willing to give. And I've had a great time checking back in with you. As we close our time together today, I want to give you a chance that you and I, as disabled people, so rarely get. And that is a chance to promote yourself, brag about any cool wins you have uh, recently accomplished, uh, just a chance to really be your own cheerleader and step up on your soapbox. If you're interested in like building community or in getting some followers, where can people find you online? Let's hear it, friend. Thank you, Nico. Um, my first children's book, Adventures Island, is now available for pre-order anywhere you order a book. It will be out on September 10th. It is the first in a series. So we are going to have a second and third book, one coming out next year. I don't know about the third book, but I know that the second book will be out next year. And I'm so excited to see what adventures that Adeline goes on. And also my podcast, The Politics of Disability, has just won Best Podcast for a third year in a row at Astoria Film Festival. So I'm very excited about that. New episodes will be released by the end of the year. And you can follow me on Instagram at Mary Fashik. Mary Fashik, an award-winning podcaster, a contract writer, and an incredible advocate. Thank you so much for spending this early morning with me, Mary. I really appreciate it. Wherever you do, wherever you go, I'm rooting for you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you.